Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And? And? Oh, I just thought maybe you'd fill something in there. Oh, I mean, I have cats <laughs> sleeping next to me right now, if that counts for anything. We have the best recording situation going on because Monster and Frankie are laying on each side of Hannah's leg right now. And they look very happy. They do. Which is actually, like, super shocking because Frank does not like my cast, even the slightest. He is very offended by it. But right now, he's actually sleeping right next to it. Yeah. And I got a monster on the other side. <laughs> so I mean, I can't say I'm very comfortable, but I'm totally fine with it. Anything for the cats. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I've got a little bit of a funky, semi-cold thing going. So if my voice sounds weird, sorry. Cool. All right. <laughs> you just keep your breath on that side of the room. I will. I'll okay. keep my breath over here. Deal. And to go with the theme of that, we're going to talk about Typhoid Mary today. Woot, 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 woot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I feel like we're watching football now. Sorry. Okay. Football. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> um, oh, I interrupted the cats. My bad. <laughs> so Sorry. I will start off by saying what book I used for this one. And you're actually going to tell us the book this time? I'm going to tell you the book. Sweet. Yay for organization. <laughs> Something I am not. Right. I have to do it for both of us. <laughs> um. So the book is called... Terrible Typhoid Mary, A True Story of the Deadliest Cook in America by Susan Campbell Bartoletti. In August of 1906, Mrs. Charles Elliot Warren had just fired her cook. She was Well, wow, staying... what a way to start. Yeah, she's fired. <laughs> uh, she was staying in Oyster Bay, Long Island, and she was very wealthy. Mrs. Warren had four children and five servants that all needed to be fed, and she was a social butterfly that liked to attend dinner parties. So uh, she's certainly not going to be the one to cook the meals. Obviously. Yeah. She's got five fucking servants. <laughs> exactly. She had very specific demands for her cook, though. You can't really enjoy your freedom, and you must be able to work 14-hour days or longer. Oh! Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> you don't want this job? No. Okay. <laughs> well, well, I'm a shit cook anyway, so. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Warren needed somebody to be available all the time. The cook has to wear a white servant's cap and apron, a plain dress, and thick-soled shoes. You can't leave the house without permission, and you might be sharing a room with other employees unless... You're willing to sleep in the attic or cellar. Absolutely not. <laughs> so, do you want to apply? <laughs> I'm going to pass on this one. Okay. Mrs. Warren called up the servants agency and told them to send her a cook. They told her they had a cook named Mary Mallon, and she has amazing references. They're sure that she'd be perfect for Mrs. Warren. Not much is actually known about Mary's childhood, but... She was born on September 23rd, 1869, in Ireland, or she could have been born in Cookstown, County Tyrone, I think. Okay. I should have looked up how to say that, but we're going to go with it. Don't well, be mad. Well, we don't even know if she was born there for sure, right? Exactly. Sweet. I bet it was probably the first one that I said correct. There we go. We're solid. <laughs> in 1883, she got on a steamship and sailed to America when she was 15. I can't even yeah. imagine uh, yeah. that. Yeah, no, I can't, no. Like, what? <laughs> and I know that's a thing that they did back then, but boy, oh boy, 15. I mean, like, I'm 27 and I don't even want to get on an airplane alone, so. No. Uh, <laughs> she stayed with her aunt and uncle in New York City, but they both died soon after she got there. Instead of running back to her parents in Ireland, she stayed in America all by herself. Wow. Yeah. Brave kid. Very. Mary Mallon was 37 years old, didn't have a family, and was in good health. 
Even though her references were great, she never stayed more than like a year or two at any of her jobs, but that wasn't really abnormal for this line of work. And I feel like the chick likes to fire cooks anyway, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why gave me that idea. I think, yeah, a lot of people at that time were like kicking people out. Yep. <laughs> Mary was Irish Catholic, and during this time, there was a ton of employers who flat refused to hire somebody who was Irish. Rude. <laughs> yeah. But things were finally starting to turn around. What's wrong with Irish? It was like this whole thing, man. I don't know. It's super not cool. Yeah. Either way, Mrs. Warren hired Mary on the spot. So she moved into the house and kept to herself for the most part. People describe Mary as intelligent, but she had a really violent temper and could silence somebody with a glare. She didn't talk much, but when she did, she never talked about herself or her past. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so everyone said she just really minded her own business. Towards the end of August, nine-year-old Margaret Warren wasn't feeling well. She was tired, had a headache, and was too exhausted to go out and play with her friends. God, me too. (laughs) I can't come out and play today. (laughs) I'm too tired. Uh, So she was running a fever and had diarrhea. I don't have that. No. No, uh, yeah, I'm good on that. <laughs> her mom was like, I'm not really worried because it's probably just summer diarrhea. <laughs> and seriously, I had to look this up because I was like, what the actual I'm F does that mean? I'm wondering what that is, too. <laughs> okay. Is this really a thing? Yes. Oh, no. I found a case study no. called The Phenomenon of Summer Diarrhea. This was also referred to as the disease of the season. What? So they had a problem with water filtration. And during the hot summer months, there was like a lot of contaminated foods. Yeah. And when they would consume them, you know, it's not stuff that was refrigerated. No, that makes sense. It does. Um, Not great, but it makes sense. (laughs) Okay, this is really funny to me. And it shouldn't be. Okay, is it, um, a, is it about diarrhea again? Yeah. I knew it. They had a popular advertisement at the time that said, all that's necessary is a few doses of Chamberlain's uh, colic, cholera, and diarrhea remedy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's... Uh, followed by a dose of castor oil to cleanse the system. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh... Oh, boy. It's probably Um, colic. Did I say colic? It's probably colic. Yeah, but I think I heard it in my head normal. Okay, well, yeah, one of those is in there. Sweet. (laughs) But it'll cleanse ya. (laughs) Um, So things with little Margaret grew worse, and her temperature was sitting at 105 degrees. Holy crap. Then she got a skin rash. Over the next few weeks, Margaret's older sister, two maids, the gardener, and Mrs. Warren all became ill. They assumed that the water was contaminated, so they packed up and they went to their townhouse for a while. Well, them and I are very different because I absolutely would have thought somebody was poisoning everyone. (laughs) I mean... Like, that's straight up where my mind just went just now. Yeah. (laughs) At the end of September... Mr. and Mrs. George Thompson arrived back to their large home that the Warrens had been staying in for the summer. They realized there was a typhoid fever outbreak in their house, and they were shocked. First off, Oyster Bay was a wealthy area, so typhoid fever was not rampant in these specific parts. It was typically in areas where, like, people were... Um, you know, maybe poor or had bad hygiene. Right, where it's going to be more, like, overcrowded, too. Yeah, yep. but again, it was blamed on the water. Right. As landlords, they're like, well, it's going to be pretty fucking difficult to rent this place now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Just a little can't bit. Can't do that. And what if there was a bigger issue going on in the house? They were wondering, is this going to be burned down? This was a real thing, by the way. If there was a bad typhoid breakout in the house and the inspectors felt that it was necessary, they would burn your house down. I'd be so pissed. Yeah. I would not be happy. 
your house has typhoid. We like, must burn it to the ground. Right. Like, pour bleach all over it or something, but don't fucking burn my house to the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's the most common cause of water contamination. A person with typhoid would use the toilet, and when they flushed, the bacteria could leak into the water supply if it wasn't draining properly. Oh. No. Yeah. No. Hopefully nobody's eating during this episode because this is pretty Well, we already said diarrhea like 12 times, so I'm pretty sure if they were (laughs) eating, they weren't anymore. (laughs) It's long gone. Uh, This is a really shitty story. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I couldn't help myself. (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, but... Are we going to be able to make it through this one? (laughs) No, we're not mature enough. (laughs) That's true. The bacteria could live for weeks in water or dried sewage. Oh, good. Mm. (laughs) Mmm. Yummy. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Mmm. Uh, inspectors came out to the house and did a series of tests. They poured a liquid in the toilet, then turned on the bathroom and kitchen faucets. So if the water were... Oh, was it like a dye? Yeah. Got it, okay. So if it were to turn like a reddish-orange color, that would explain the contamination. But the water was clear. They collected samples outside and from the well. They didn't find anything in their tests, and this remained a mystery. When the Warrens left the home, they did not bring Mary with, uh, the cook. And she just ended up leaving and going somewhere else. (laughs) They said, bye, bitch. Yeah. (laughs) Well, she wasn't sick, so they were like, okay. (laughs) The landlords weren't comfortable with just accepting this as a big mystery, so they hired a sanitary engineer, George Soper, to do a... What? Yeah. He's a sanitary person. His name is... His last name is Soper. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, that is... That is just brilliant. (laughs) That's amazing. He had no choice but to be this. I love it. Uh, So he was being brought in to do a full investigation on the house. He carefully built a timeline of when everybody got sick and who left the house. He realized that Margaret first got sick three weeks after they hired a new cook. He knew immediately that Mary was the one that brought typhoid into the house, but he did not have a clue where she was now. George called up the agency that Mary was hired through, and they didn't know where she was either, but they were able to provide a list of the past seven families that she worked for. George was like, oh boy, okay, well, this is a start. George was the perfect guy for the case because He was a sanitary engineer with an interest in disease prevention. And a perfect last name. Yeah. (laughs) In fact, he had studied the work of Dr. Robert Robert Koch. Let's go with that. A famous German bacteriologist. Now, this is where I'm going to present an example of how awful it is to find the correct way to pronounce things. Okay? Per YouTube videos, The last name could be Ka, Kosh, or (laughs) one video, the lady said, cock, like a male chicken. I'm not kidding you. Like a male chicken. She literally (laughs) said it. (laughs) Uh, So anyways, um, his last name was spelled K-O-C-H. So it's whatever you Um, want it to be. K-O-C-H? I knew somebody with that last name in middle school. It was Cook. (laughs) Stop it. I'm not kidding you. It was Cook. I'm not even listening. See, this is the problem. People, this is, it really is. It, we it really is. need to find one way to say everything because then this wouldn't be so confusing. That's okay? so funny. Was Cook even an option on no. that? No. <laughs> and I watched like six different videos on this guy. Yeah. You said to figure K-O- it out. K O C H. Is that how you said it? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly how, how she used to spell it. It was, but she went by Cook. Okay, well, it's <laughs> ka, kosh, cook, or cock. You pick. I don't care. <laughs> I, I just don't want to deal with it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but this is why I don't want you coming at me <laughs> when I say something wrong. I tried. 
Yeah, and I mean, we put so much research into everything, like, please don't fault us for not being able to say a freaking name that Google told us 12 different (laughs) pronunciations for. (laughs) We try. Uh. (laughs) Well, anyways, he was able to prove that specific germs caused specific diseases and that germs were contagious. Scientists were realizing that a small percentage of people who actually recovered from diseases such as diphtheria, cholera, and typhoid could still transmit the disease, even if they seemed healthy. This small group of carriers may have no idea that they're actually spreading the germs around. In 1902, Dr. Robert published a paper about these healthy typhoid carriers over in Europe, and he won a Nobel Prize three years later. This concept of healthy carriers had not trickled into the U.S. yet, but here it was. This might be the reason that this case is so well known. This was just a theory that George had, though. He needed to put in the work to collect all of the evidence. He started contacting the families that Mary had worked for, but things were not as easy as he had hoped for. Most of the families had gone through cooks or servants so often that they they didn't even remember her. Exactly. They didn't remember anything about, like, this quiet cook that was keeping to herself. Why would you? Right. However, in nearly every household on the list, there had been an outbreak of typhoid fever. The only house that didn't experience this had two older people and one servant. So it's possible that they already had typhoid when they were younger. Oh, okay. Mm Mm-hmm. George had discovered 22 people, including the Warren family, that had typhoid after Mary was hired. Oof, that's a lot of people, actually. A lot. Holy crap. In every case, Mary was the only person in the house that didn't fall ill Uh uh-huh and then she would just leave soon after george finally tracked mary down and she was cooking for the bound family by the time he found her the family already had typhoid running through them and their 25 year old daughter ended up dying from it no i know george knew that he had to talk to mary and figured that he could go explain things to her and see if she would seek help. He showed up at the house and talked to Mary in the kitchen. Unfortunately, George wasn't very tactful, and Mary got really upset and defensive. People didn't understand germs in the same way that we do now. Mary appeared healthy, and she took pride in cooking and keeping herself and her workspace clean. I mean, honestly, why wouldn't you get defensive, though, when, like, if you really think about it? Yeah. Because, like, there, here comes this person coming in, like, you're the reason that all these people have gotten sick, even though you're completely healthy. Like, I'd be pissed, too, honestly. Absolutely. And she's just a cook. She's trying to make that living. She's yeah. all by herself. I probably wouldn't love being accused, either. No. <laughs> so now she's got somebody criticizing her and saying she's spreading diseases everywhere she goes. George keeps pushing at her and tells Mary that he wanted to ask her some questions and get some specimens from her. You know, just urine, feces, blood. No big deal. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. He also told her that he would pay for the medical expenses. Now, remember, Mary has a bad temper, but George didn't know about this. Mary starts swearing, and then she grabs a carving fork and lunges at him. What? Yeah, but George got the message, and he took off running. Well, the temper was a lot worse than I realized. She's Irish. Oh, yeah, good point. (laughs) I think it's clear that George should have, you know, turned his findings into the Board of Health, but he wanted to take a different approach here. He found out that after work, Mary would often go to a rooming house and she would bring food to a policeman there. George befriended the policeman and took him to a saloon for some drinks. Somehow, he convinced the man to let him wait inside his place for Mary so he could talk to her again. Brave dude! I think it's a bad idea, George. It's a terrible (laughs) idea, but freaking brave. Yeah. He didn't work alone this time, though. He brought an associate who was a medical doctor named Bert Hubler. 
So George and Bert waited in a dimly lit hallway for Mary, which, um, spooky. I hate that. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, if anybody waited in a dim lit hallway for me, I How would be How about you just don't wait in hit. hallways for me? Yeah, do not. Yeah. It's not polite. <laughs> <laughs> So she stops by after work, and she lost her shit when she saw the men. She insisted that she had nothing to do with spreading typhoid, and she didn't even have symptoms of it. Like, she's like, leave me alone. George eventually heard rumors that Mary was going to leave the family that she currently worked for, and he was like, I have to put a stop to this. He met with the New York City Department of Health and explained how Mary was a menace to the community. They were like, your story is compelling, but very circumstantial. Mary looked healthy and hadn't violated any laws. If she didn't want an exam, the city can't really force her to do one. Right. They did agree that Mary should be tested, and they hoped that a woman could try talking to her instead. Dr. Baker was sent to speak with Mary, but nobody briefed her about the difficult case that she was taking on. So she shows up at the house and she's like, hi, I'm here to take your samples. Oh, no. And Mary's like, well, (laughs) fuck off. That's not happening. Dr. Baker called her boss and said Mary refused. And he was like, "Okay, well, I guess I have no choice then. He told her to wait on the corner, and the next morning, there was going to be an ambulance and three policemen waiting for her. He's like, Mary better give those samples, or she's going to the hospital by force. Dude, just give up the damn samples. (laughs) Yeah. The next morning, Dr. Baker did exactly as she was instructed, and she waited on the corner. Once the police were there... She took one of them inside with her, and Mary lunged at her with a long kitchen fork. What is that with her and the freaking kitchen utensils, man? <laughs> I mean, oops, they might have forgotten to uh, warn this lady about, about Mary's temper. temper. Of course. Oops. Mary was able to run through the kitchen and vanished. The officers searched the house, but she was gone. When they went into the backyard, they found a trail of footprints in the snow. The footprints led to a fence, and a chair was propped next to it. The search lasted a few hours, and they finally were like, yeah, we gotta call this quits. As Dr. Baker was leaving, one of the officers stops and taps her on the arm and just points. There was a pile of trash cans in front of a door, and a tiny piece of blue dress was peeking out. Ha 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 ha. They pulled Mary out, and she was fighting and swearing, and she was forced into an ambulance. Mary kicked and screamed the entire way to the hospital, and Dr. Baker sat on her. <laughs> now, <laughs> Holy crap! I can't imagine how long this ride was, but the ambulance was attached to horses. Oh! <laughs> So, there's that. (laughs) When she got to the hospital, she was put in an isolation ward. When Mary used the toilet in her room, the samples were collected and sent to the lab, and they took her blood, too. There wasn't any bacteria in Mary's urine, but they found cultures of typhoid in her feces. This means that the typhoid had settled into her gallbladder. This only happens to 1% of people that get typhoid, and in Mary's case, she didn't recover from the disease. She carried it for life. Literally? Yes. Holy crap. So if you remove your gallbladder, which, I mean, it's not really something you need anyways, it can potentially remove the disease from your body, or it can move somewhere else in your body. Oh. So, who knows? George tried to explain everything to Mary and said he wanted to write a book about her case, but promised he would not use her name. She was absolutely not going to help him and certainly didn't care about this book. No one is quite certain who leaked the story. But two weeks after Mary's arrest on April 2nd, an article was published in the New York American paper. The reporter tried to get her real name, but no one would tell. So. The paper dubbed her Mary Ilverson and gave the wrong hospital name as well. Really? Yes. 
Once the story was out, officials moved Mary to a quarantine hospital located on North Brother Island called the Riverside Hospital. It was on a 13-acre island in the middle of the East River between the Queens and the Bronx. The currents were really strong, so it was too dangerous to swim to shore or even take a small boat, so you can't escape. Oh, that does, well, all right, Hmm. I mean, okay. So Mary stayed in a small bungalow on the riverbank. She was so stressed about this whole thing that her left eyelid became paralyzed for six months and she couldn't close it. Oh! I didn't even know you could get that stressed. That can happen? Like, oh my god. I mean, my eye twitches sometimes when I'm stressed, but... now every time I stress... I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be so scary that my eyelids are gonna <laughs> stay there and not like be paralyzed. That sounds awful. I know. <laughs> During the day, she had to hold her hand over her eye, and at night, she tied a bandage around her head to keep her eye closed. Her eye did eventually heal. Samples were collected from Mary multiple times a week. Sometimes they were negative, and sometimes they were positive. This means she was an intermittent carrier. So sometimes she sheds the disease, and other times she doesn't. What? Yeah. This is crazy. I didn't know that was possible. I've never heard of that. Doctors gave Mary plenty of medications, but nothing worked. After 10 months, they just didn't know what to do with her. So doctors were like, how about we release her? They asked her where she would go, and she was like, well, I'll just go back home to New York City. Health officials in New York were like, no, that's not an option. We don't want you back. I mean, understandably. Yeah. A nurse told Mary her release was refused, but she was like, here's what you should do. Write a letter to the officials saying that you're going to go to Connecticut to live with your sister. Well, Mary didn't have a sister in Connecticut, and she didn't want to like, follow instructions to lie. The nurse told her, fine, then you're a hopeless case. Mary told a reporter that she was told all she had to do was leave the state and live under a new name, and then she could have her freedom, but she refused this. She wanted to clear her name. In July 1908, Mary arranged for her urine and feces to be analyzed by a private lab in Manhattan. She contacted that police friend of hers that she used to cook for, and she was like, hey, can you come make a visit over here? So on visitation day, he took a ferry and went to Mary's cottage to collect the samples, and then he delivered them to the lab. I mean, like, what a friend. (laughs) Not in the real, though. Over the next 10 months, he brought at least 10 specimens to the lab for Mary and he kept reporting back that the specimen was negative for typhoid. Her specimens tested positive eight times in those same months at the cottage. So she believed that she didn't have typhoid, and this only confirmed those beliefs. It's hard to know exactly why this private lab never found typhoid, but Mary figured the Department of Health was out to get her. They were just using her for experimental research. I'm not sure how long it took for the specimens to actually reach the private lab or how long Mary kept them or how she kept them before sending them to the lab. Right. And I feel like that could all play into things. I definitely think so, yeah. When she pushed for a release date, she was told that she had to let the surgeons take her gallbladder out first. That's the only way out of this. And that didn't make sense to Mary. Sometimes they say she's sick and sometimes she's not. Hell. The doctors couldn't even agree on where the germs were in her body. They all had different theories. As Mary was working hard to clear her name, a physician referred to her as Typhoid Mary during a lecture, and the name stuck. That was it. For a full year, only Mary's first name was known, but that soon changed. One day, Mary opened the newspaper and saw an article with her full name and It included illustrations of her. Uh Uh-oh. She was humiliated. I would be pissed. No, I would be too. That's so mean. One person that read the article was 34-year-old attorney George Francis O'Neill. 
He felt that this whole thing was absurd, and he offered to represent Mary. At this time, she had already been locked up for more than two years, and she was finally going to have her day in court. Mary certainly didn't look sick when she showed up to court, and that surprised everybody there. And they figured, well, then she's got to be a witch. God, of course. (laughs) They're always a witch. Always. (laughs) Always. She possessed the power to stay healthy while making others sick when they came in contact with her. I mean, that sounds like a witch. I mean, it does. (laughs) Attorney O'Neill argued that no law justified Mary's arrest and imprisonment, and the hospital can't take her specimens without her consent. As of Mary's hearing in 1909, the health department had actually identified five healthy typhoid carriers in New York City, and they were all left alone. Really? Yeah, they weren't being quarantined like Mary was. Okay. Physicians argued that Mary was singled out because of her occupation as a cook. She was causing a problem, but the other carriers weren't. Attorney O'Neill presented the lab results from uh, the private lab Mary had been working with, and this obviously contradicted the information that the hospital was providing. Yep. The court proceeding lasted three hours, and not one witness testified against Mary. Three weeks later, the court decided that it wasn't illegal to hold Mary and she was going to remain in custody. They felt that they had to do this to protect the community. Okay, well then go grab the other five too. (laughs) I know, but the other ones aren't causing a problem. Well, I'm sure they are. They just don't realize it. Oh. So Mary remained on the island, and she wrote many letters to the doctors that were working on her case, and they described the letters as violent and threatening. I kind of assumed. Uh, She vowed that if she ever was to be released from the island, she would get a gun and kill the doctors. Because that makes them want to release her. Yes. Yeah. Let's get you out of there. Mary was finally offered a deal. If she agreed not to cook, if she promised to take precautions when it came to hygiene and protecting others, and if she reported monthly to the health department, she could go free. And didn't shoot the doctors? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure that's part of it. Mary agreed and put it down in writing. After almost three years, she was free. Mary did visit the Department of Health regularly, just like she promised. She didn't handle food for other people, she wasn't a cook, and for good measure, she didn't murder the doctors. Oh, that's good! (laughs) Mary was working in laundry now, but the pay was really low. She returned to Attorney O'Neill and hired him to represent her in a lawsuit against New York City and the Board of Health for false imprisonment. She asked for $50,000 in damages because it was now impossible for her to cook, and her chances of making a living were very low. This was dismissed right away, and the judge said it lacked merit. Soon after this, Mary stopped reporting to the Department of Health. I mean, honestly, though, I feel that. I probably would, too. When you're, like, locked up like that for three years... That, I don't know. That's hard. Yeah, I probably wouldn't return either. The Sloan Hospital for Women in Manhattan had a huge spike in typhoid, and it was out of control. So this is a maternity, maternity hospital. 25 typhoid cases broke out in January and February of 1915. 24 of the victims were doctors, nurses, or members of the hospital staff, and one patient got it. And two people had already died. The hospital was getting a really bad reputation, and people thought it wasn't clean. The hospital's chief physician called up George Soper, the one that had started the case against Mary. I remember him. (laughs) Of course you do. They knew he was an expert, and they were like, you need to get here immediately. George arrived at the hospital and questioned them about their food, water supplies, and kitchen staff. They were like, well, we just hired a new cook three months ago, Mrs. Brown. Oh, no. Okay, is it Typhoid Mary or is it really Mrs. Brown? Well, George was like, I'm going to need to meet Mrs. Brown, but suddenly she was nowhere to be found. 
Oh, no. The chief physician said, well, I do have a letter from Mrs. Brown, if that helps. And George was like, well, guess what? I've been the recipient of a lot of Mary's little letters. Yep. So he looked at it and he was like, oh, yeah, Mrs. Brown is Mary Mallon. Are you kidding me? No. Okay, like, I find, like, I don't know. Once you know that, like, you really are spreading it, I don't care how much denial you and I think it's really fucked up to keep spreading I, it. I agree, but the problem is that she didn't understand. Right. And a lot of people didn't understand how germs work. Yeah. On March 26th, 1915, a patrolman reported that a woman wearing a veil had entered a house in Corona, Long Island. The officer recognized Mary's very distinctive walk and saw her carrying a bowl of gelatin, and the house was guarded by dogs. The officer was requesting backup. Police were dispatched to the home, but nobody answered. One officer found a ladder and propped it against the house, and then he just climbed right up, opened a window, and went inside. Okay. Yeah. I don't think you could do that, but maybe back then you could. Right. <laughs> There was a fox terrier and a bulldog waiting for him, but he brought pieces of meat to give them because he had been told that they had dogs. The officer found Mary in the bathroom and she was taken back to her bungalow on the island. I mean, whoops. Yeah. Doctors did attempt to cure Mary by giving her five or six billion typhoid bacilli. They later found out that she wasn't really taking the pills. She was just hiding them. Holy shit. In 1918, Mary wasn't fully released, but she was now granted permission to leave the island during the day for work. She got a job as a housekeeper at a hospital and worked her way up to nurse and hospital helper over the next seven years. She was later hired as a lab assistant, and she prepared glass slides of specimens and kept records. Which, like, you would kind of think that you'd start to understand things here now when you're working with specimens, but... Right. Well, that's what I'm know. saying. Yeah. Her coworkers had incredibly positive things to say about her, and they noticed right away when she didn't show up to work on September 23rd, 1932. A coworker went to her cottage, and knocked on the door. It was dark, and the curtains were all drawn. The coworker heard a loud moan, and Mary was on the floor, paralyzed on her right side due to a stroke. Oh, no. So she was hospitalized and bedridden for the next six years. When she was 69 years old, she got pneumonia. Mary ended up dying on November 11th, 1938. Nine people showed up for her funeral, and it's not because people didn't like her. I think it's because she was forced into isolation for so long, everyone right. just kind of lost touch. Yeah. Because everybody said they really liked her. The summer after Mary had her stroke, she requested a meeting with her attorney. She had saved up money from the hospital work, and she wanted to make a will. She left $200 to Father Michael Lucy, who had visited her, and she left $250 to Catholic charities. She left money to her friends and wanted her clothing and personal items to go to her friend's mother. Mary paid for her funeral, her burial, and her headstone and wanted all remaining money to go to a friend. And that is the story of Typhoid Mary. Dude! It's really a bummer. It, that yeah. she just didn't understand it. Right. And I think from the way it was presented to, it really seems like people went at her in such a combative way. That's not the way to get somebody to understand. No, it is it is definitely not. Um hiding in a dark hallway yeah. and surprising somebody, uh taking them completely off guard, not the way to do it. No. Right. Yeah. It's not yeah. quite there. So it's unfortunate that it went that way. And it just, oh my gosh, she spent so much time in that cottage. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I get yeah. what she did is wrong. Like going back to being a cook was so wrong. It was. But she wasn't making money. Yeah. And it's like you're taking away her livelihood and the way she supports herself. Yeah. And now what? 
I don't know if they presented her with an option. I don't. I don't. Guess, I, yeah, I guess I don't know. They're if like, they're, just don't be a cook. Is anything else you can really do? Yeah, per se. I don't know. Like the one thing that you've always done, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, Which okay. would super suck because, like, if I got told I couldn't PCA anymore, I'd be so lost because I've been PCAing for years. So I'd be like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, what? <laughs> yeah, I I don't know what you do at that point. Yeah, I don't know either. So, that was a good one though. Yeah, I thought it was you know something a little different. For that was us. super interesting. Yeah. No, I liked it. It reminded me a lot of your story. Like when you were going through it, I was like, oh, with the uh, TB. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know why I'm so intrigued by stuff like that, but I just really am. Well, and, like, think about it nowadays. If if they just have somebody that is spreading a disease and they're like, okay, well, now you're going to live in this little cottage. Right. Uh. <laughs> I mean, there would be a freaking outrage of people, too. And now we're going to get emails of, like, this happens today. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> Whoops. Well, then we want to know about it, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, so make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a voicemail, and then we'll play it. Uh, send your listener stories over to drinkingthekool-aid@yahoo.com. Give us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, Bye. bye.